Welcome back to lecture two of unit three. Today is March 26th. And some quick updates slash announcements. Um, first of all, thanks to you who have turned in the pocket mouse lab. And if you haven't done so, please get that to me as soon as possible. I'm going to be a bit lenient with due dates just because of the whole online transition and everything. So um, I'm just going to be lenient for this week. And, you know, starting next week, we're going to have to kind of get back to a normal schedule. So just get that to me if you haven't. Um, additionally, remember that the Unit 2 reflective writing is due by 11 p.m. on Monday, March 30th. So today for your assignment, we're going to be doing the antibiotic resistance lab. And since in our case, we can't actually um, streak bacteria on auger plates physically, we're instead going to do a case study um, of some medically relevant antibiotic resistant bacteria. So um, basically read that case study and the instructions that are on Moodle and then answer the multiple choice questions on Moodle and try to have that done by 11 p.m. today. Um, currently on Moodle, there's also a Google Sheet link that shows the upcoming assignments and due dates. Um, this is basically to help keep you guys organized um, during this time. So it's, it's a little harder since we don't get to interact in person to make sure that you know that you guys are aware of everything coming up. So I just wanted to make that uh, kind of put everything in a central place. And so that's at the top of the Moodle page. It's above um, the units. And I think it's at the bottom of that list below announcements and things like that. So hopefully that'll keep to um, helps keep you guys organized in that regard. OK, so for today, for unit three, we're going to be diving into the history of evolutionary thought. So. Tuesday, we talked about um, Darwin and his theories and kind of the, um, the idea of natural selection driving evolution. So today we're going to talk about kind of what preceded the, these evolutionary theories and how they came to be. We're also going to talk about some of the mechanisms, some of the um, forces that drive evolution. And then, of course, on your own, you're going to do this antibiotic resistance case study. Okay, so coming back to evolution by natural selection. So this slide's really important. Basically, just memorize this slide. This is one of the most important things we're going to learn. Um, so natural selection was Charles Darwin's idea, and it's the principle by which each slight variation of a trait, if useful, is preserved. So natural selection is about adaptation, right? Adaptation to the environment and keeping traits which, are, which help an organism to adapt. Um, either to a changing environment or just to basically fit better into um, a stagnant environment. So natural se um, selection is driven by these principles. And so first, there is variation that exists within populations of organisms just naturally. And so we know, know that this is different um, due to differences in the alleles within the genes of organisms, and that can arise due to mutation. Second, there is a struggle for existence due to limited resources, and more individuals will be born than will survive due to this. Um, due to that, individuals with favorable adaptations are the most likely to survive and produce offspring. Therefore, the favorable adaptations will be inherited and passed on to subsequent generations. And then, over long periods of time, successful variations will produce differences that result in the formation of new species. And so this is um, all falls under the concept of Darwinian fitness, which is basically um, in its simplest form, just the ability to produce offspring over generations or the ability to pass on your genetic material to the future generation. So the question is, um, what basically pre-existed this um, evolutionary thought and how did Darwin kind of arrive at this line of thinking? So let's talk about the things that shaped the theory of evolution. So in pre-Darwinian uh, thought, there was this idea of a great chain of being or a hierarchical structure of all matter and life. And this idea was popular in medieval Christian Christianity. So this picture is a little hard to see, but basically what it depicts is this um, this great chain of this great chain of being idea. So um, at the top of the chain of being, you have God and angels, right? And that's fo followed by basically the higher up people in society, kings and queens. Then there's common people. And below people, we have animals, plants, and then non-living things. And so the idea of this is that um, 
basically, you know, as you go up the ladder, each each is a higher form than the last. And so the great chain of being actually derives from, basically derives from um, Plato's theory of forms. So you've probably all heard of Plato. He's a very famous philosopher. And Plato believed in sort of this dualist philosophy. He believed in two worlds, basically. So the world that we live in and in which um, material things exist, he called this the physical realm. And then there was the realm of forms or the realm of ideals, um, which comprises the abstract, perfect and unchanging concepts behind, um, behind the physical forms, basically. So Plato believed that physical objects were simply imperfect, um, imperfect examples of the forms. And since the forms are the unchanging and basically outside the realm of time, they're timeless and they never change, he believed that the forms are actually more real than their imperfect um, physical embodiments. So to kind of depict this idea of Plato's theory of forms, um, within forms in the realm of being, um, you can see basically there are ideals up here. And so this is this is kind of um, outside of the physical world, but just in the, the world of the forms. And so you can see there are forms basically of both ideas and of physical things. And the things, act, um, the physical things actually exist in the realm of becoming. And so things are changeable, right? They're sensible, they're copied, and they're imperfect, basically versions of these forms, um, which are trans trans um, transcendent, eternal, intelligible, arch archetypal, and perfect. So forms, Plato thought, are actually the cause of all things, whereas the things themselves are just imperfect copies, basically, of the forms. And so to further illustrate this, I went ahead and drew a shape for you guys. And so looking at this shape, you'd probably say that that is a triangle, right? But if we look closer, is this actually a triangle? So um, I'm not exactly the foremost expert in geometry, but a triangle is supposed to be composed of three straight lines, right? And the internal angles of the triangle are supposed to add up to 180 degrees. So if we look at this triangle, well, you know, the lines aren't straight. I'm sure the angles don't add up to 180 degrees, especially since, you know, at the top here, the lines aren't even connected. And so basically this triangle, um, despite the fact that we all recognize it as a triangle, is just an imperfect embodiment of the idea or the form of a triangle. And so that was kind of Plato's thinking, is that physical objects are just imperfect embodiments of the forms, which are basically more real than the things that we um, interact with and experience in our realm. So from this great chain of being came um, this idea basically of the, of the hierarchy of being, right? That was popular in the Roman Empire and medieval Christianity. And so this came from basically from a literal interpretation of the Bible which resulted in the idea of the fixity of all things or um, everything that exists within, the, um, within the, the physical forms is something that's going to be unchanging. So this idea of an unchanging world. And so this of course came from um, a very fundamentalist creationism, which basically um, people believe that species were created by God, that species are unchanging over time and that variation within species is just the imperfect copying of the original plan of God. And so this um, is part of the thinking in, in both the Roman Empire and in, in uh, medieval Christianity that basically came before any evolutionary thought. Then around 1500 to 1700 was the time of the scientific revolution. And during this time, there was an archbishop named James Usher who um, used a literal interpretation of the Bible to try to estimate the age of the earth. And through some um, interesting math, he basically came up with the idea that the earth was created about 4,004 years before the coming of Christ, which would make the earth at the time less than 6,000 years old. And so at the same time, because of the scientific revolution, we had basically people paying more attention and trying to understand the natural world. And this started to create sort of a paradox for the um, prevailing sort of creationist belief systems. 
So people were finding, for example, fossils of species that were no longer represented on Earth, which led, of course, to the idea of extinction. But the question was, how could um, species be going extinct if, you know, if we live in an unchanging world and species are basically um, are basically planned by God? So then at some point, evolution started to come into the picture. <clears throat> so a French guy named Comte de Buffon proposed that species change over time in response to the environment according to natural laws. And so this was kind of the first idea that two or more species could be derived from common ancestors. And so this was um, basically the first idea of evolution kind of coming into the picture. And a little later on, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, um, perhaps you've heard of Lamarck before, he's a pretty um, key figure in the basically the train of thought of evolution. But Lamarck proposed that organisms adapt to the demands of their environment and that their features develop according to the wants and needs of the organism. And so um, Lamarck's evolutionary model basically relied on the ideas of vitalism, which is the idea that living things are fundamentally different from non-living entities, as well as spontaneous generation, or the idea that species don't go extinct, but instead evolve into more advanced species. Um, and simpler organisms, therefore, must be constantly created by spontaneous generation. And he also believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And so what does this mean? Basically the idea that, um, in, or that species can um, evolve due to their needs within their environment. So here's an example of what that might look like. So Lamarckian evolution right, is based on the principle of evolution based on want and need. So the idea um, within Lamarckian evolution is that this is sort of the um, depiction of the evolution of a giraffe. And so basically you have this kind of, you know, horse-like creature initially. And if that um, creature needs to reach basically um, higher vegetation due to a, due a, to a changing environment, then th those creatures could adapt based on need, grow a longer neck, right, in order to retrieve that food. Whereas Darwin's line of thinking is more that um, there's natural variation that already exists within populations. And over time, as um, certain species have an advantage, they'll be more likely to reproduce and pass on their genetics. And um, alleles, allele frequency basically changes within a population in that way. So there, were, there are some obvious issues that kind of stand out right away with the Lamarck Lamarckian evolution. So for example, uh, one question is, you know, would we expect the offspring of someone who devoted their life to bodybuilding, um, would we expect their offspring to be extremely muscular just by nature? I mean, the bodybuilder obviously has acquired these traits, and so Lamarck would expect those to be passed on to the offspring, but we kind of know that isn't true. And in a similar line of thinking, if someone lost an arm during their life, um, by Lamarck's model, probably all of their offspring would be born with, with one arm, right? And so we also know that not to be true. So Lamarckian evolution had some obvious, um, some obvious issues with it that were basically corrected over time. So around the same time that Darwin was working on his theory of evolution, there was this guy named Alfred Russell Wallace who was also working on a somewhat similar but perhaps less developed theory of evolution. So um, similar to Darwin, actually Wallace had gone to the Galapagos Islands and he noted that they contain little groups of plants and animals that are peculiar to the islands themselves. But the, um, the little groups of plants and animals most nearly um, allied to those of South America. So he started noting the existence of different basically allied groups of similar um, <clears throat> species of organisms based on geographical location. And so he proposed that every species has come into existence coincident both in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. And so the idea, right, of speciation or the idea of evolution over time. So Wallace actually published some of his findings before Darwin, despite the fact that Darwin had kind of been working on this longer. And Darwin actually had a little bit of a more developed model. So of course we've gone through um, Darwin's model, but we'll go through it again just to kind of highlight some of the key differences. So Darwin published on the origins of species by means of natural selection. 
And so Darwin had this idea of natural selection or a force that works on um, adaptations within species. So again, his principles are that variation occurs naturally within populations. And of course, Darwin didn't know exactly how this happens. Nowadays we do. So we know that um, variation occurs in populations through basically mutations and epigenetics, right, that influence gene expression. And um, basically, Darwin, this principle demonstrates that it's not really need that creates variation, but rather variation pre um, has to pre-exist the need within the population. <clears throat> so organisms are not going to develop traits in response to um, to a means of selection, but rather that variation has to um, pre-exist within the population. And that's really important. That's, that's probably one of the most common misconceptions of evolution, despite the fact that, um, that Lamarckian evolution has kind of been basically overturned by this thinking. So variation occurs naturally. Um, there's a struggle for survival due to limited resources and individuals with favorable traits will have more offspring. In other words, they have higher Darwinian fitness. Then the offspring of these individuals will inherit their traits. And again, Darwin didn't know exactly how this happened because he didn't really know about DNA and the principles of inheritance. So we now know, right, that DNA is the hereditary molecule. Um, but Darwin's thinking was um, sort of this idea of gemules that are created by all cells that can be modified by the environment. So as you can see, the idea that basically um, these um, hereditary units can be modified by the environment. There's actually some Lamarckian thinking here. So, you know, Darwin didn't have it all figured out, but he did give us a pretty good model to work off of. So then the favorable adaptations that are inherited and passed on for multiple generations um, can be selected over time in order to produce differences that result in the formation of new species. And so this is the idea of um, evolution based on natural selection. So Darwin ultimately helped overturn some of the um, prevailing ideas of the time, such as fixity of species, vitalism, goal-oriented evolution, special creation, a static world, and the young age of the earth. And so basically this was an example of a paradigm shift, right? Because we moved on from this um, creationist um, way of thinking into this idea of um, speciation through evolution. And so speciation, the formation of new and distinct species, um, actually doesn't always have to occur due to need or because a population is on the verge of extinction. So when we talk about natural selection, we kind of think a lot about this, um, this constant struggle for survival and basically individuals kind of always dying off and only the strongest surviving. But there are actually other forces that drive evolution aside from natural selection. So now we'll talk about the, um, some of the forces of evolution that can basically drive this process of speciation outside of natural selection. So before we get to that, just some key terms um, that you should be familiar with in order to understand these forces of evolution. So first, evolution itself is a change in allele frequencies within a population over time. And a population is defined as the members of the same species that regularly mate with each other in such a way that alleles are exchanged throughout the population. And different populations will typically have differing allele frequencies, and they're often phenotypically different as well. So even within the same species, um, different populations can basically have slightly different traits within them based on their um, based on their own gene pool and their interbreeding. The phenotype, of course, we've discussed this is the um, observable traits of an organism or its physical characteristics. Population genetics is the study of the genetic makeup of a particular population as a whole. And then the gene pool are the alleles within a specific population. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of these terms, let's talk about the four forces that drive evolution. So the first that we've discussed already is natural selection. Another is mutation. The third is called gene flow. And the fourth is genetic drift. So it's important to keep in mind that these forces are not mutually exclusive, and they also do not act um, independently of one another. 
And so these are dynamic forces that are basically constantly um, interacting with one another in order to drive evolution and speciation. So first, natural selection. Of course, the process by which organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. So natural selection is an adaptive force of evolution. It's actually the only adaptive force of evolution. Next, mutation. So mutation, as we know, is a chemical or structural change in an individual's DNA. And so these changes can be due, can be to one or more nucleotides or to parts of chromosomes. And so this can be chromosome rearrangements, it can be insertions or deletions in DNA, or it can basically just be um, changes at a single nucleotide. So there are a lot of different forms of mutation. However, as an evolutionary mechanism, mutation itself is generally pretty weak. And the reason for this is that in animals, mutation rates are generally very low, and they're more often costly than they are advantageous. So mutation is therefore a type of non-adaptive evolution on its own. However, it's important to keep in mind that mutation is the original source of biological variation, and it's crucial for all the other evolutionary processes, therefore. But on its own, it is a fairly weak um, driving force of evolution, basically. So next, there's genetic drift, um, which is the random fluctuation of gene frequencies from one generation to the next. And genetic drift is another example of non-adaptive evolution. So genetic drift is only a powerful evolutionary force really in small populations. So alleles can be established or completely lost in these cases without reference to their collective value. So genetic drift um, is usually a force that reduces genetic diversity. And one part of genetic drift is actually called the founder effect. So you may have heard of this. Um, but it's when a small subset of a larger population basically breaks off and establishes its own gene pool. So some examples of this are polydactyly, um, or extra fingers and toes in eastern Pennsylvania Amish populations. And another idea of flight, another example of the founder effect is how, um, I think we've talked about how Genghis Khan, um, a very basically unusually large um, proportion of Asian individuals share ancestry with Genghis Khan because of, um, you know, during the, during his conquests, basically, his Darwinian fitness went up quite a bit. Um, and again, that wasn't necessarily due to any evolutionary advantage, but just kind of the um, random events that took place, right, the random fluctuation of gene frequencies. So next we have gene flow which describes the movement of genes and or alleles from one population to another within the species. So gene flow is another example, again, of non-adaptive evolution. So there are basically two components of gene flow, and these are migration and admixture. So when two pop separate populations of the same species um, end up coming together, either due to migration or another process, you get this admixture of, their gene, of the genes within the two populations. And so gene flow in that way can actually reintroduce some of the genetic diversity that's lost to genetic drift. Okay, so those are the four forces of evolution. So it's important to keep in mind that they're not mutually exclusive and they also don't work independently of one another, right? So they're all dynamic processes that feed into one another and drive changes in allelic frequencies that ultimately drives evolution and speciation. Okay, so that's it for today's lecture. So um, at the end of this, go ahead and work on the superbug case study. So that'll serve as today's lab. So first read the instruction sheet on Moodle. So basically within the case study, there are gonna be um, questions and kind of like breakout activities that you don't need to worry about. Just worry about the multiple choice questions that are on Moodle. And that's it for today, thank you.